Assalamu alaikum dear viewers, peace be upon you all. Welcome to our show uh, commemorating Muharram and the story of Ashura where we will be discussing different aspects of the story of Ashura. Joining us today on our show is Sheikh Abbas Banju, Sayyid Mohsin Shah and with some poetry and to add to the discussion, Muntazir Jafar. Our topic today is going to be discussing the motive of Yazid and why he fought, fought Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. We're going to look at why he did it, what were the different roles at play, and ultimately how he was unable to recognize God's chosen authority on this earth. Sheikh, starting with you, one thing that comes to mind is that when we go for the pilgrimage to the tombs of the holy personalities, we say this line quite often, uh, I come to you knowing your right, Arafan bihaqqiq, I believe the Arabic is. Yes. What does it mean to know the Imam and, and, and the right of the Imam? Because this was clearly lacking um, on the day of Ashura. Of course. Um, to be very honest, brother, the question that you have asked is indeed a fairly deep question that probably needs um, hours and hours of discussion. <clears throat> However, in a nutshell, Ma'rifah has certain darajat. Just like Iman has levels, Yaqeen has levels, Ma'rifah also has levels. So from a theoretical perspective, the concept of Ma'rifah is not a binary issue where it's one or zero. La, there are grades of Ma'rifah. There are certain categories and what is matloob or what is uh, required from us is to ascend those ranks of Ma'rifah. The higher our position in Ma'rifah, the greater our attachment towards Ahlul Bayt, attachment and obedience towards Ahlul Bayt. What is sufficient in terms of a nutshell, a summary of an answer which is, inshallah, a comprehensive answer as well, is that Ma'rifah of Ahlul Bayt is that you not only fully need to recognize but implement in your life. Mm. You need to understand that the Imam being divinely chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute embodiment of truth in its entirety, number one. And number two, when you understand that the Imam is the um, divinely chosen embodiment of truth in its entirety, your submission to the Imam needs to be unconditional. Mm. This is something which is absolutely difficult to attain, but not impossible. Absolute, unconditional obedience to the Imam. You know the weight of these words? If my akal tells me do X, but the Imam says do Y, I do Y. Mm. When I understand that submission to the Imam is unconditional because he is the absolute embodiment of truth and divinely selected by Allah Azza wa Jal, then the wishes and the commands of this Imam should be preferred over my mm. own personal based desires. Could I parallel that to, for example, Nabi Ibrahim, peace be upon him, where he was told to sacrifice his son and maybe the intellect might say that's your son but unconditional divine submission to the truth sure. we wouldn't say that the intellect says this is my son because what we have within the hadith is that the intellect as a faculty um, understands and drives us towards submission what I would say is that my emotion or my desire yeah. would tell me 
that my son, my best interest, factors that affect the thinking process of the mind. These external factors might push me away. Overcoming these by having absolute deep recognition that this is the embodiment of truth and unconditional submission is necessary and required. And this is all extracted. The istidlal is from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah wa ati'ur rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Obey Allah, obey the Prophet and the ulil amr. When Allah says what is understood, again, hadith in which there is unanimous agreement between the Amma and the Khasa that the ulil amr, the first of them is Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. For Amir al-Mu'mineen and then by extension the Imams from his lineage. When Allah Azza wa Jalla says within the Quran, obey me, yani obey Allah, obey the Prophet and the Ulil Amr, is this obedience conditional or unconditional? Unconditional. Unconditional. Like the way our obedience towards Allah is supposed to be unconditional, our obedience towards the Imam is also supposed to be unconditional. Understanding this, number two, implementing this in our daily lives. You have the manifestation of this arifun bihaqqiq. Mm. You find another dimension of arifun bihaqqiq and you will find that this is a item or this is a, this is a concept that comes up repeatedly, not only in the ziyarah of say the shuhada, but in the ziyarah of all the ma'asumin. You will find this phrase in the ziyarah of Imam, uh, Imam al-Qadim and Imam al-Jawad and uh, Imam Ridha. Every Imam whose shrine that you go to visit, you will find that this phrase is over there. Arif and Bihaqqiq. Together with this, an explanatory note of Arif and Bihaqqiq. liman walakum wa liman adakum. You find this in its uh, phrases and different variations inside of Ziyarat Ashura, in the Ziyarat Mutlaq of Imam al Hussein, the numerous Ziyarat that are there, and you find it even in the Ziyarat of Imam al Qadim and Imam al Jawad, and so on and so forth. That I have absolute affinity towards you, and I disassociate myself from your enemies. This full disassociation from the enemies. And 100% alliance and affinity with Ahlul Bayt is a consequence of this ma'rifah. Mm. Because the intellect commands you to side with absolute truth at all times in all places. Mm. Sayyid Mohsin, looking at history, so Yazid clearly knew, um, quote unquote, who the <coughs> Imam was. He knew who Imam Hussein was. But obviously, he didn't have the recognition that Sheikh described. I mean, when, I, when you read history, Yazid's in power, he's got everything, and there's, there's just one man who's saying no to him. What's Yazid's motive to actually go through with this whole campaign if against we, Imam? Because we look, it's one person. Yeah, we look at history, it's a bit more than that. It's very political yes. in, in, from the side of Yazid. Um, what happens is, is that Yazid inherits yes. from his father his uh, power, his army, his wealth. Um, but no one really takes him seriously and no one sees him to be fitting as a Khalif. So what he tries to do is that, okay, I need the support and backing of an individual that can kind of like solidify and people can acknowledge my power. The only person that he thought was, uh, or his advisor would say that, look, if you get the support from this family, Bani Hashim, the Ahlul Bayt, yeah. then it will kind of like, you know, make everything legit, legitimize everything, and you know, people will recognize you as the Khalif. However, this is where Imam Hussein salam, takes a stance saying, someone like me can never ever give support to someone mm -hmm. like you. So, this is his main objective here is to kind of like, you know, legitimize his power simply because even in the public eye, no one sees him to be fitting as a Khalif. Mm. So, his motive was to get. Uh, the support from Imam Hussein so that he can become the Khalif. Imam Hussein has a strong uh, stance against him and this will lead him to, to actually say and go and say, alright, if you're not going to give me support, I, it's either you give me the support or I'll kill you. And then this is where it comes from. And then we have the, you know, the, the people rising uh, against Yazid or in Kufa 
when uh, you know Hazrat Muslim bin Akil goes to see the support because we know that Imam Ali was in Kufa, the capital of the Islamic um, you know Khalifate was in Kufa. These people haven't forgotten who Imam Ali was, and these people haven't forgotten the importance of Imam Hussein. So there, there there's a rebellion and a rise against Yazid. Uh, we see that um, Muslim bin Nagil goes to, to uh, acknowledge and, and to, to um, verify that yes, these people are here to, to support you and this is where Imam Hussein is going towards Kufa to gain that support and probably go and challenge Yazid and his power Yazid, tries, Yazid tactically comes and stops him in between uh, mm. and, and it's, it's, well, it's quite clear in Karbala either join us or you'll be killed Yeah, so um, once looking at today's world in particular what are the parallels you can draw where I'm looking at the angle of Imam Hussein is in a, is in a minority, clearly. Um, we know he had reportedly 72 companions with him versus the tens of thousands that Yazid had. Where, where do you see in the world today where we may be in the minority but we have to stand up to a bigger power um, because they might feel threatened by us? Is there, are there any parallels we can draw to the story of Ashura to the modern world? I think there are very many parallels that can be drawn. Um, but taking it to a more grassroots level, um, in, in that to say that places where you have to stand your ground when you're faced with um, challenges um, where one side could involve you compromising your faith, yeah. um, especially in the day and age that we live in, in the Western societies, in, in, in the countries that we live in, one of the challenges that I find as a student yeah. is a lot of the time I'm having to stand my ground in terms of listening to music or or um, going to places where we shouldn't be going as, as, as Muslims because of what we believe in. Yeah. See, one side of that involves me standing for my faith because I will say I don't go to these places, um, I don't listen to music because my faith tells me not to. I suppose it's very hard as a student, it's, the it, university lifestyle that's, that's around It's challenging, us, right? It's, because it, it's so normal mm, it's for everyone to do that. that exactly. That do, yeah. And you see, Yazid had, had tempted the people so much so that all of them thought that Hussein went, was in the wrong. Mm. Part, part of the reason some of the narrations say that, that they didn't let, they, they wanted to let Imam Hussein pray because he was a Muslim, but someone pointed out that, you know, if we let him pray, then the people here will see that he's actually mm. doing something right. Mm. And they're here under the assumption that he's doing something wrong. Right? So, yeah. so sometimes you have to stand your ground, and that's one of the challenges that I draw, or the parallels that I draw from. Yeah, because, I mean, from your perspective, you're almost going against the grain, aren't you? You're that yeah. minority that wants to exactly. not have fun. Um, not have fun, yeah. That's the thing, whereas you've got a higher goal in mind, absolutely. Um, Sheikh, did, what did Yazid fear? What, what, what was he threatened by? Was he threatened? Um, Habibi, the, the tyrant and the dictator always fears truth. So you find this throughout time? Yeah. yeah and why was... Uh, Fir'aun, with all the power that he had, feared Nabi Musa. Hmm. Why did uh, the Romans, in their strength of their empire, and the high priests, why were they threatened by the message of Nabi Isa? Hmm. It's true. Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi, what fear did he put through to Muawiyah even after the sulh, mm. even after the ceasefire? We've said a number of times, sulh al-Hassan, the word peace treaty of Imam Hassan is an inaccurate expression. When you read through history, it was not a peace treaty, it was a ceasefire. Mm. Even after the ceasefire, when Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba has gone back to Medina, Muawiyah still poisons him. What was the fear? Imam al Qadim, Musa ibn Ja'far al Qadim, alayhi salam, who seemed to be an Abid in the eyes of the normal person, an Abid worshipper in Medina, what threat did he pose to this empire of Bani Abbas? The unborn Imam, Al Hujja, Ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif. What threat did he pose to Bani Abbas? An Imam who's in Ghaiba today mm. still poses a threat to people. Mm. How, do we di how do we dissect all this? How do we understand this? The fear of truth prevailing. Because when you're on the other side of truth, 
And you know that when this haq or this truth prevails, you have everything to lose. Mm. And hence, you will do everything in your power to conceal this truth. Because you being the representative of falsehood, the basis of you assuming power is based on falsehood and manipulation. The only manner in which you can preserve your seat is to eliminate the threat of your opposition, which is also the embodiment of truth. And hence, you find this, this is, a, this is within the norm and the seerah of all the dictators and the tyrants, be them within the fold of religion or outside yeah, of the now religion. When I think about it, you're right. The fear of truth prevailing. This was one of the greatest fears of Yazid. If Imam al Hussein was allowed to be free within the earth, within the land, he would expose the falsehood which Yazid and his fathers stood for. The falsehood and the, 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 the inaccuracy, the invalidity of the premise upon which they have got the seat of power. And that's why I suppose in our, in Zira Ashura and other Ziaras, we don't just condemn Yazid, we condemn those who paved the way. Ah, Santo. There is an entire chain, chain in that, you see, Zulm does not happen overnight. An oppressive power does not, an oppressive party does not come into power overnight. Mm. There are many prerequisites that have happened. And you find that this is something, Bain al Qawsin between brackets, this is something that is applicable even when it comes to understanding Alamat al Dhuhur of Imam al Hujjah, Sharif. The advent of Sufyani. Yeah. It's not that just one day the Sufyani wakes up and causes havoc on earth. Sufyani is a byproduct mm. of many other injustices injustices that have happened along the way. Yazid was a byproduct, a la'in, of many injustices that have happened since the martyrdom of Rasulullah. For yeah. you have this fear of you preserving your seat, which is built on a premise of falsehood, and this can only be obtained by concealing or by suppressing the truth, number one. And number two, you have this driving motive which is understood from the text. See, this is also another important rule of thumb. Whenever we're trying to understand Karbala, whenever we're trying to analyze Karbala, we have to be very important that we don't put forward a wrong analysis or a wrong understanding of Karbala. So the rule of thumb is that whenever you're analyzing Karbala, the stances of Imam al Hussein, what motivated the enemies, that we go back to the texts mm -hmm. where the Imams themselves speak about this, or the enemy out of his own account says the truth. In terms of acknowledgement or confession, you will find that the driving force behind, one of the driving forces behind the Yazid's uh, brutal pursuit and massacre of the Holy Family was his hatred towards Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. And this becomes manifest. The proof for this is where the poetry that he recites, mm -hmm. when the sabaya are brought into Shah, to paraphrase this poem, uh, or to, to translate it very briefly, uh, it goes along the lines that I wish my forefathers in Badr would have been here today to see the achievements and the grief of Ali Muhammad. Mm. It's referring back to what? The time when Amir al muminin was responsible for sending his forefathers to Nar Jahannam in the Battle of Badr. Mm. So this hatred of Amir al muminin is a driving force that, that led these people to rally against Imam al Hussein from the side of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. There are, see, in the army of Yazid, you look at the psychology of the enemy, you will find that within the numbers that fought against Imam al Hussein, 
each person was fighting Imam al Hussein with a different motive and with a different understanding. There were some who were there for the money. There were some who were there out of fear because it was enforced military service. So if you didn't go forward for the war, your family would get killed. You would lose your house. So they, they really didn't want to fight Imam al Hussein. They knew he was on haq, but they couldn't take a stance. Forced military participation. Then you had those who thought, no, he's truly astray, and that the Khilafah is truly with the Yazid yeah. al -Ain. So you have all these groups of people who come inside. But coming to this thing of Amir al mumin you find that even in the final moments of Karbala, when Imam al Hussein was in the battlefield and the enemy was not able to come close to him because of the uh, uh, ferocious manner in which Sayyid al-Shuhada was protecting himself and defending the family and the women. This is after all his companions have died. There is a part within the maktal where it says they were reluctant to even come next to Imam al Hussein. They are reluctant to attack Imam al Hussein. What does Omar ibn Sa'ad al-La'in say to encourage and motivate his army to go forward and attack Imam al Hussein. Because now, imagine from military perspective, war tactics, the enemy is at the lowest level of morale. Ajib. <laughs> they are at the lowest level of morale. Imam al Hussein, all his family members have been killed. He is the only one in the battlefield. They are not able to come close. The enemy says the more we attacked him, the more his face began to glow with the nur of Allah Azza wa Jal. They're at the lowest level now. They have done everything to bring down this man and they can't. At that point, to motivate them to go forward and fight Imam al Hussein with one final attack and one final push with everything that they have. What did Omar ibn Sa'ad say to motivate the people? He didn't say, go forward and I will double your reward. Mm. Or go forward and you will become governor of this and that. What did he say? He said, oh people, this is the son of the quarrelsome one who killed our forefathers. So they used the hatred of Amir al Mu'minin yeah. as a motivational factor to go and attack him. And you find this within the Makatil. And it's, it's, these are the things, indications that allow us to understand the psychology of the yeah. enemy and understand the brutality the extent of the brutality that they were ready to go for because they were driven by oh this God. emotion called hate. Mm. Hate of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. Thank you. Uh, Montezé, I believe you have some poetry prepared um, related to this topic. So if you could please um, yeah. maybe introduce it and <coughs> please recite for us in tradition. So it's um, really about the atmosphere that surrounded Yazid at the time. An ego fed by falsehood, a facade raised up on lies. The prince of the believers, but is that really what they believed? For if they believed for even a second in the actual truth, then they would never have fought the one who spoke only the truth. Reform was Hussein's goal, what he set about to bring, yet Yazid thought his throne was at risk and his position as king was in danger. That's why when Yazid said Bay'ah, Hussein said, Hey heart. When Yazid said Bay'ah, Hussein said, Hey heart. So Yazid resorted to killing him near Farat, a river that today flows as a result of the lover's tears. A river that today flows as a result of tears, whilst near it is buried Hussein's nears and dears, whilst near it buried is Hussein's nears and dears. Thank you. Absolutely oh, beautiful. Sayyid Mosin. To carry on the discussion, obviously, we know quite clearly, Imam was killed. As Sheikh described, the brutal moment it happened as well. What did Yazid actually gain from this? Because you'd think he's won in a sense. But what's, what has what he gained from killing the Imam? In reality, you know, in the Quran it clearly says one who takes one life is like you have taken the whole of humanity. Now, how many died on the plains of Karbala? Mm. And what was the cause of their death? What was, what was Yazid trying to, 
gain from you know defeating or killing and butchering these people in the short term Yazid would have thought he has a you know mission accomplished that he has taken away the opposition and all roads now lead towards you know leading the Muslim Ummah or the Caliphate but in reality we see two things first of all we, are, we know his Akhara is certain of, of hellfire and secondly I think he underestimates the daughter of Amir al-Mu'mineen mm-hmm. and how her and also the son of Imam Hussein, Imam Sajjad salam, how they managed to convey the truth and the reality of what has happened on, this, on the tragic day of Ashura and the reality of who these people really are because there was so much propaganda against Bani Hashim and against Imam Hussein but later on we see from say the Zainab, we also see from Imam Sajjad the efforts that they've put in that actually overturned the public opinion we know that as soon as they were captured um, people started to revolt against Yazid and what have you done? this is the, the grandson of Rasulullah how could you have done such a thing? so in short term you know, he may have thought that yes I have, I have won and I am in power but the reality is thanks to Say the Zainab and also to Imam Sajjad, um, he lost public opinion um, and, and public support, and which you know definitely led towards his doom. Mm. What is it, as an as a student, how has Imam Hussein won? What do you, what's it, he's won clearly um, with the amount of people that remember him. To you, how has he won, even though he was killed? I think his victory is highlighted in his legacy more than the event. Mm. Um, I think he's won because of what he left behind for us. And he's won because the stuff that he left behind for us, there is nobody that can claim that that stuff is related to 1400 years ago True. and is not related to today. I think you look around, you look at how much loyalty is valued today, even within the youth, right? Uh, you don't want to be found uh, backstabbing someone, yeah. or, or you know? And I think those are the kind of lessons that we learn from, from Karbala. We learn from Imam Hussain how to, how to stand in the face of people who want you to do something else. To stand firm in what you believe in. right? And if that's not what is respected today, then I don't know what is. Mm. And I think that in itself highlights his victory. Mm. Yeah, and, and to wrap up, Sheikh, I'm going to ask you actually the same question. As someone who serves the pulpit of Imam Hussain, has the honour of doing so, uh, how does the victory... Although losing, we have this famous phrase that's used, a common proverb, right. losing the battle but winning the war. Sure. Um, how do you, as someone who serves the pulpit, how, how do you witness that Imam Hussein has won? Um, Brother Zamir, if you ask me, even the notion that the battle is lost, I don't agree. Sure. I don't think there is any aspect. Not I don't think. I know there is no aspect of Karbala that Imam al Hussein did not win. Mm-hmm. Who said he died? Who said he died? Wala tahsabanna ladina kutilu fi sabil illahi amwata. The Quran says, do not consider the people who are slain in the way of Allah is dead. Mm-hmm. Rather, they are alive and seeking his risk. So who said Imam al Hussein died on Ashura? Allah. Imam al Hussein became immortal on the day of Ashura. <laughs> became alive. Till today, 17 million people on the day of Arba'in or on the ziyara of Arba'iniya in its entirety paid tribute to this man. Who said Hussein lost anything? Mm. Even when you come and you look at it from a warfare perspective, 72 men fighting an army of 30,000 immediately on the field, 70,000 with reserves, leading to another 120 with further reserves. As per the ahadith, what we understand, 72 men to stand up against 30,000 up till the time of Asr. Show me in the history of human warfare where this has happened. Mm. And for them to have been inflicted with as many casualties. Who lost the war? Imam al-Hussein definitely didn't lose the war. He became immortal on the day of Ashura. 
And this is what I believe, and this is the faith with which I hope that we are put into the grave. That mm -hmm. Imam al Hussein was immortal at every step of Karbala. In terms of this, the legacy of Imam al Hussein, one of the greatest things, not the greatest, one of the greatest, is this power of inspiration. When you are motivated to make change in life, all you need to do is look back to Imam al Hussein, is to read over the history of Imam al Hussein, just read over the manner in which he was martyred. And this in itself is powerful enough to make you change your destiny and your life. There is no other human event that you can find from the Anbiya, from the Awliya that can cause as much change or has that much potential for a person to embark change as Karbala. So as a factor that inspires you towards change, this is the greatest legacy of Imam al Hussein. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And what a wonderful note to close on. Before we close on a eulogy, I would like to thank our guests, first of all, for joining us. And for our dear viewers at home who, like me, must have benefited greatly from this topic. <coughs> it's quite clear, and I think the, the clear message of today's show, uh, which, which really hit me, was that a tyrant is, might have all the power on, in the world, but clearly it is a truth that they fear. Um, one small um, knock to their kingdom or their power with the truth can bring down the empire, which is what Imam was saying show. Uh, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A small eulogy in honor of the nights that we're in, um, remembering Sayyidina Zainab Salamullahi Alayha and Abu Al-Fadl Al-Abbas Salamullahi Alayh. Small conversation between them. Ya Abu Fadl, khallini hal yawm ashufwek. يا ابو فاضل بس لا تجي بلا تشوفك يا ابو فاضل خليني هاليوم اشوفك يا ابو فاضل بس لا تجي بلا تشوفك حفره وخويا قبري تجري لا ما تجري يا خوزي أنا يا بزي أنا باين لشنت باسم القمار يا خوزي أنا يا بزي أنا باين لشنت باسم القمار عيشتني بوحشة بعدك وانتظر أمر القدر تدري وافتني المنية وقبري هاليوم انحفار تدري وافتني المنية وقبري هاليوم انحفار شعطلك عباس عني خاف ما عندك خبر شعطلك عباس عني خاف ما عندك خبا وبغربتي انتظرك بكل حنيني وبغربتي يا كافلي ما تجيني بالهم اقضي عمري تدري لو ما تدري بالهم اقضي عمري تجري لو ما تجري اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد